questions after the presentations from the panellists. And also just to let you know that the session will be recorded and distributed to all attendees and also uploaded to the ULI's Knowledge Finder after the event. So just to introduce the event very briefly, because we want to hear mostly from our panellists, obviously. Uh, my name is Esther Dickens and I'm a member of the ULI Australia's Women's Leadership Initiative. And I'd like to note that along with Jess Kite, Nadia and Sonia and um, my other fellow organisers from the ULI, um, we've all come to this position to present, uh, to bring in this presentation today because through our careers um, we have been involved in some elements of planning and designing with country. However, um, through that experience I suppose what we learnt is that we don't know very much. The more um, that we see and start to scrape the surface of understanding country, the more we've learnt what we don't know. Um, and we really wanted to bring this series of events to the industry and to the ULI uh, in order to continue that wider education process around country within our industry. So um, we bring you today three wonderful speakers. Danielle Promack, Becky Kittle and Clarence Slokey. I will let them introduce themselves a little bit more before their presentations today. I trust that you've read their bios um, so you have some background on where they're coming to us from. Uh, our panellists have all been kind enough to donate their time today to continue this process of expanding our industry's understanding around connection to country. Uh, a topic, of course, which has always been incredibly important, but now is really just starting to break through into the day-to-day -day consciousness within our industry. Um, we know also that in recognition of the value of the knowledge that they're sharing with us today, the ULI will be donating the profits from this event series um, to the Mundjungawa Women's Place in Redfern, which is a wholly run Aboriginal women's support um, centre um, to support local Aboriginal women and their children. So now, um, without any further ado, I, I will hand over to Danielle, who will introduce herself and start the discussion around what is country. Hi, everybody. Um, hopefully my screen is going to be sharing shortly. Um, can you see my screen? Just can you confirm? Yeah, yes. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, Walawani, Jindawan, this means safe travels in the Durja language on the south coast. You can see there on that map, um, Budawang country, which is um, on the south coast. That's uh, my mob. Um, I'm here on Gadigal lands with relationships to people in Gumbangia country. Whoops, that's going to slide through without me giving it permission, I think. How do I stop that? Does anyone know? Okay. Um, and I also grew up on Bundjalung country, which um, I feel also a connection to because it's where I was mothered, if you want. So this is my country on the south coast. This is just after a ceremony happened there. Um, we still have ceremony on the south coast. Uh, and it's really important to us that we maintain our, our, um, our practices of culture and um, deep tradition. This is a ceremony that calls the whales north and it was about uh, three years ago now, actually pretty close on when the whales start to go north to give birth. And you can see it's the leftovers of a ceremony, not the ceremony itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to talk a bit about country because we often use this word, but I wonder if people have really got an understanding of what country really means to us. Um, we, I write it with a capital C, that's my choice, just to differentiate it with what non-Indigenous people um, use in terms of country with a small c. For us, country uh, is significant. It's our lived experience and it's our heritage. Um, it's our past, present, future, and it finds us to place. It includes everything in the landscape. Oh, no. Sorry, I don't know why it's doing that. I apologise. I'm going to have to take control of my um, thing and apologise a lot for that. <clears throat> it includes the water, the, the sky and the land. Um, 
it's not just uh, the land, it's everything that you can, that you sense within the landscape. It's flora, it's fauna, it's animals, it's microbes, it's the largest to the smallest. Um, it's also what, it's also things you can't see. It's the intangible, uh, the immaterial, the knowledges. It, co country holds all of our culture and therefore, and all of our knowledges and um, it therefore passes that on to us through country. It's our spaces and our places, and, and it's also our relationships and our connections. It's everything that exists. It's everything that we don't even know exists. Um, and it's all of, it's of course our ancestral domains as Aboriginal people, and, but, and of course, uh, more broadly, um, First Nations people across the um, globe, though I imagine they call it something else other than country, and hopefully Becky will talk a bit, little bit to that. Um, but it's more than that. It's more than just a line on a map that you can see. It's um, more than just geography. It's everything in the landscape. There's no such thing as a wilderness. Everything's important to, in terms of country. There's nothing that's vacant or empty because it's all connected and it's all required and it's all important. So when injuries do happen to country, um, then they are, you are injuring, and injuries of course mean um, infrastructure, roads, landscaping, um, buildings, structures, uh, and other, and mining and other behavior that uh, has been introduced to this country. Um, that, that impacts everything else and impacts all of the things that are connected to that place. Uh, and of course our culture is coming from that, from country and we maintain that through our memory, through the memory of country and also through practice, our own practices. As Aboriginal people, country is inherent to us. Uh, we don't own or earn country. Um, and therefore it's important to our identity because it's how we come understand ourselves and how we um, gain wellness and, and uh, self identity. It's of course our place that we return to for healing um, and strength. And my elders certainly say to go back to country when you're not feeling well, put your feet on the ground and you'll, and, um, and ask ancestors uh, for healing and for strength. Um, and it, despite changes to the landscape through um, what's happened through colonial practices, country still, um, still there and still important and it doesn't matter that cities built on top of it it's still it's still impactful and our ancestral beings are still there waiting to hear from us and waiting to communicate with us so i guess what i'm saying is um yes the land can, and water and sky can themselves can be impacted um, but it's our relationships that with country that are what needs to be maintained um, and it's our own relationships that we need to rebuild in order that country is um, reclaimed and repaired uh, is part of this, I guess, designing with country process. So how, what, the question that I really want to address is how can we live in this place forever? And this place that I, you're looking at right now is on one of our sacred mountains. Um, I, I spend time, I'm lucky enough to be able to spend time with my elders fairly regularly. And one of them, Uncle Greg Sims, he was talking about conservation and it occurred to me that in, for our profession, we have a really long way to go to be really sustainable. And to a certain degree, we are asking the wrong questions. I think the quest, this is the question we actually need to be asking with the, with the emphasis being on forever, because at the moment we're not thinking like that as we work in the built environment. I think First Nations people across the globe um, have been a answering the qu this question for a lot longer than anyone else has even started to think about it. Um, using our laws and land, pra land practices and our spatial um, practices. Uh, but when the, when, when the Europeans introduced um, their own versions of these, they, we've been, so they've been superimposed on top of our ways of understanding and um, we haven't been designing in a way or um, doing architecture or working in the built environment in a way that is sustainable for this place since then. So these are what my elder, these are the principles that Uncle Greg Sims tells me. He says that um, when I ask him about, about how we can live here together forever, <clears throat> he says this is what the old people have said about conservation, always show respect, 
Acknowledge, never be greedy, always share. Don't take too much from the water or bush and always listen. The thing is, um, if these principles were uh, practices of, of sustainability for the built environment, we would, we've all immediately, um, I guess, broken these principles. Oh, sorry. We've immediately broken these principles. Um, when you think about the basics of always show respect, have we shown respect to country in the built environment? Have we shown respect in the way that we do construction? Have we shown respect in how we're choosing our landscaping, for instance, the plants, etc.? cetera? Um, I would argue no, uh, that the built environment is responsible for up to 50% of the landfill waste and 50% of, 50 of climate change and 40% 40, 40 of energy usage. Um, so this is according to some research. So despite having all of these ideas about about um, about sustainability, we're still behaving like this. Um, and this doesn't even start to address these questions about uh, the destruction of biodiversity and habitats, as well as, of course, to air and water and and even noise pollution, which you probably can hear me behind <laughs> here behind me right now. Um, so we're we're not acting in a way that is forever. We're not acting, behaving in a way where country has voice. We're not behaving in a way where that's respectful. Um, and we're certainly acting in a way that's quite greedy still. Definitely taking too much from the bush and from the water. And I would argue that listening is still um, a long way off. I'm sure you've seen these. I just wanted to include them in, um, hopefully my thing doesn't flick over again. I don't know how to stop it. Um, these are around a lot. This is what I call a hierarchical approach with men uh, at the top. And I'm sorry to say that men are still at the top. Um, the women might be below them, but I would argue maybe dogs even come above women still. And we've seen that around us very much in the in Australia, at least um, recently in our parliament and other um, workspaces. This approach is, is what's causing a lot of damage. And um, I would argue that, that country, which is the golden bar at the bottom, is what's being damaged the most. Um, whereas this approach where country is held, it's a relational, everything's related and everything's equal, is where country um, is what's, in, what's considered first. And this is where, where I think we need to start in terms of understanding country in relation to the built environment. That country needs to be what's where we start not where we end. Country needs to be first, not last. Because when you're considering country, because country uh, considers all relationships and includes all relationships, you are therefore considering all relationships and including all relationships. There's so much to say about those two diagrams that, that probably needs a whole session in itself, but I hope you start to understand that it's a really different way of thinking that we need to do um, in the built environment in order to truly be designing with country and certainly to be connecting with country. This is just a diagram. Again, this is, needs um, days of discussion and a, and a whole PhD, but it's my way of understanding cult, cult, country in relation to the built environment. And it's not to separate out these layers, but rather to see the, um, the relationships between them. The country is all of these things. It's the landscape, the land, the water, ecology, the law with a capital L, the law of the land, the law that can't be changed by, by humans, um, that was passed down to the dreaming, through the dreaming. It's the knowledges, it's the very deep earth where the ancestral beings um, arose out of to, in order to be uh, to develop um, the landscape. It's also the cultural expressions, the pathways, campsites, special places, law, that's law, L-O-R-E. That's um, uh, the knowledges that are passed down between peoples, um, between generations, and um, are still being passed down despite colonisation. Of course, we know that many of um, the, our roads and other other places that we now still go to are on original pathways, um, original um, sacred sites, are now churches, um, men's hunting grounds, and our football fields, our sports fields. We know that this is um, this imprinting wasn't accidental. Uh, of course, it was convenient because those roads already roads already existed as pathways, but they also 
it was also purposeful. Putting a church on a on a um, on a sacred site meant that when you went to the sacred site, where were you going? Now you were going to church, and so that's where religion became part of the colonial process, as one of the many ways that it did actually. So the colonial grid got imprinted over top of cultural expressions, um, and within the colonial grid is the built environment that we're all we all perceive that we work within. Of course, I would argue with work within all of these realms, structures, the buildings, the streetscape, but it follows the colonial grid. It follows the cultural expressions, which follows the landscape. And of course, the celestial, which is the, of course the skyscape, um, stars, air, clouds, sun. It's also of course our dreaming and our ancestors because many of our mobs believe that when our um, lights go out, we go to join our ancestors in the sky, um, around the campfires in the sky. Now, all of these are connected. And as I've already talked a bit about how some of them are connected. The roads are laying ac across, um, across pathways, which are laying across the landscape as being the best place to walk or the place that takes us to important, um, the roads that take us to important places. Um, and I guess that what I'm trying to say here is that Everything that we do is country. The materials you choose are country because materials come from country. Therefore, whatever you choose to do is, is enacting with country and requires those principles that Uncle Greg talks about, about respect and always listening and acknowledging and not taking too much is part of the behaviour that we need to be um, bringing into this understanding of country. We can't step out of it as people working in the built environment professions. We don't have a choice because everything we're doing is, enact, is acting with country. And that's including landscape and including the decisions that you make about what plants you're gonna plant. Are you planting um, plants that belong? Or are you planting colonial plants that are gonna add, add to the colonial um, behavior that's already been happening? Well, um, I think I've probably gone over my 10 minutes, so I'm just going to say um, Walawani Jindawan again, um, safe travels, and uh, hopefully um, talk to you after this. Thanks so much. Thanks, Danielle. That's a wonderful introduction for us all. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Becky Kittle. We've brought Becky in today uh, to bring us an international perspective and really broaden that idea that Danielle raised that um, that country, whatever it might be called around the world, isn't uh, an Australian only or an Aboriginal only idea, that we were all once better connected to the country when we lived in a different way. Um, and so Becky's going to bring us a bit of that perspective from uh, New Zealand. Thanks, Becky. Oh, kia ora koutou. Um, nei rā te mihi ki a koutou tēnei rā. Uh, I te taho tōku kraua, ko hikirangi te maunga, ko waiaputawa, ko Ngāti Krau te iwi. Uh, I te taho tōku kuia, no Ngāpohi. Um, engari i tipu aki au i, i here taunga, i noho ana au i, i poneke, e nā e nei, ko Beki tōku ngoa. Um, so kia ora koutou in the language of, of my people. Um, I was just saying that um, uh, talking about, I guess, my country, um, to, to use the, the, the topic of the day. Um, and I'll just share my slides. Um, hopefully I can do that here. Can you see that okay? Cool. Presuming that's okay. Um, so just... Um, just to start really with, with the introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this today. Um, and yeah, just give my respects to all the, all the First Nations peoples um, on whose land we, we, are, we are constantly um, sitting and standing. And um, just to assert the fact that none of us ever gave up sovereignty, um, despite the way the world is, is happening these days. Um, but back to the question of, of what is country. So I guess perhaps a sort of equivalent in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, is the notion of Tūranga Waiwai. So whenever, um, which actually means standing place, Waiwai is, is the word for feet or legs. Um, tu, tu is tu, Tūranga, I guess, or Tū is to, is to uh, sit, stand. Tu is to stand or to sit. Um, 
hence Tūranga Waiwai. Um, and whenever Māori introduce themselves um, more formally, i.e. not to saying hello, um, there's always a, a reference to country in that introduction. So just then I said, Hikurangi um, is my te maunga, or is my mountain, and, and this artwork from a fantastic Māori artist, Robin Kahukiwa, who's also of the same tribal heritage, uh, depicts um, that those, the country, I guess, that we come from. So you can see very clearly that that country is, is personified as a way of, I guess, kind of highlighting the kind of connection to country as, as our ancestor. Um, so Hikarangi is the maunga or the mountain, Waiapu is the awa or the river uh, that I belong to, and Ngāti are the are the iwi or the people that I belong to, at least on my grandfather's side. Um, and I guess there's some clues in the way that we treat a whole lot of things in, in Māori culture around um, what is country. So um, when a baby is born, um, there's a placenta, as you all know, and in, and in the te reo Māori, the Māori language, that's called a iho whenua. Uh, whenua is also the name for land um, in, this, in te reo Māori. And when a baby is born, that iho whenua gets buried in the whenua as a way of linking that child with, with, the, with the land from which they came. Uh, so there's a very kind of clear um, suggestion in language that we are inextricably connected uh, to, to the land from where, where we come from. Um, and over time, boundaries were marked by mar mountains and rivers and lakes and streams. So um, there's always this constant kind of reference to, to the whenua or to country whenever we, we speak about identity. And one of the things I've been doing with some of my first year or second year architecture students is getting them to come up with what's called a pepeha, which is a, which is what I was just showing you before. This is a sort of pepeha. So what what mountain do they do they relate to, or what river do they relate to? And this there's a, there's a bit of politics in doing that if you're not Māori, um, but there's some lovely kind of language now that um, non-Māori are using to at least acknowledge perhaps that they don't belong. To that bit of land but they have um, a heart for it I guess. Um, and I think we can also get some more clues um, around how we think about country from from the creation stories or narratives um, and I won't read this all out but essentially you can see that there's um, our that the I hesitate calling them people but the the beings that created our world um, are many, and there's Papa, Papa Tuanuku, who's, who's our Earth Mother, Rangi Nui, who's Orangi, who's our Sky Father, Tangaro, as God of the, um, the sea, and then there's Tane, Nui Arangi, um, and so on and so on and so on. So all the, the, the Tangaro and Tane Nui Arangi and, and Tane Mahuta, and, uh, sorry, not Tane Mahuta, uh, Tuma Toinga, and a whole lot of other um, brothers were, the, were their children, um, and they represent a whole lot of different realms, realms of sea and um, the forest, um, different types of food, um, war and peace, um, earthquakes. So there are lots of kind of natural, um, environmental um, things that, that these, these, I'm gonna call them gods, it's not quite the right word, uh, represent in our creation story here in Aotearoa. Um, and I think this quote's useful. It's Ranginu Walker, who was a really prominent Māori academic at Auckland University, unfortunately passed away now, explains that the personification of natural phenomena in the Māori pantheon is fundamental to the holistic worldview of the Māori. And that word holistic is incredibly important. And you could see um, there's very similar um, understandings between what Danielle was talking about, um, between what, what Māori are talking about here. Papa Tuanuku, so the earth mother, is loved as a mother is loved because the bounty that sprang from her breast nurtured and sustained her children. 
people belong to the land, are an integral part of it, and are expected to relate to nature in a meaningful way. So this notion of mana becomes really important. So mana is a, is a really kind of sophisticated word. It's really quite hard to translate into English, actually. Um, often people will translate it as prestige or power, but it's not quite right. Um, or having kind of control over or dominion over or things like that. Um, but you get a sense, at least, of what the word means by some of those, those English words. So broadly speaking, it's sort of having responsibility, at least in built environment terms, for that particular place, for a particular place. Um, it can also mean a sort of spiritual power. Uh, for example, if a forest has mana, it will have plenty of flowers, fruit and birds. Um, and what is well used now is the notion of mana whenua. So, um, as, as some of you will know, there was, a, there was a treaty signed between the British Crown and, and Māori in the 1840, in 1840, and that um, the English version was different from the Māori version. The English version offered the Crown sovereignty. The Māori version only offered the Crown governorship, and there's been um, havoc ever since because they were both saying different things. Um, but part of the trying to rectify some of the wrongs that have happened over the years um, has been a sort of uh, a treaty settlement process whereby different tribes have um, have taken their case to the crown and said hey you screwed us over basically um, you know give us back some of what we lost and often what is given back is about one percent of what is lost uh, by the way um, but through that treaty process um, the concept of mana whenua has become really strong. So thinking about who does the Crown have that treaty relationship with, that partnership relationship, that obligation uh, to work alongside Māori, and um, the, con the, the conclusion is that the, the Māori group that has mana or particular um, prestige is the, is the group that is of that particular place. Um, so there is now a very strong sense, at, at least in the built environment, that mana whenua values and identities must be recognised. Um, and so that particular tribal group um, should have their particular values and their particular identities understood in that particular place. So it's no longer um, appropriate to be um, understanding this in, in very kind of wide ranging Māori, you know, using the term Māori um, way. So for those who don't know, Māori actually just means normal. And um, so when there were, there were no Māori before non-Māori came, um, people were of particular tribes. Um, but of course, there was a sort of amalgamation of identity, I guess, when, um, when the British came. And so the word normal Māori was used to, to sort of demarcate a particular people group. Um, but there's now a move to say, well, actually, I'm not Māori, I'm Ngāti Pro or I'm Ngāpohi or, or whatever tribal group we are. But the concept of mana whenua is particularly important. Um, so what's gone wrong? I mean, I think one of the biggest things that has gone wrong is, is, is this overlay of another set of values. Um, so this image is put up on our, um, there's an online encyclopedia. The title is Māori Land Loss, but actually what it represents is, a, is an overlay of another value set that, that deems land to be, be able to be a commodity. It's the encroachment of private property ownership and thus the removal of or the erasure of a, of a value set that says, well, actually we don't, land shouldn't be a commodity. It should be shared and belonged to and protected and, and you know, sustained, um, used. So not, not the kind of Western notion of conservation where you hive things off and protect them and, and don't, don't use them. Um, but the, the Māori notion of conservation is much more about, about sustainable use. So quite, quite different. Um, I, I like this uh, quote from actually Australian academic Deborah, Deborah Rose Bird who talks about the calendar being reset to year zero and the colonial frontier whereby 
authentic place only happens post colonization. And you can see the grid that Danielle was talking about very clearly happening here. So often these towns were designed in Britain without even understanding the topography and there's lots of hills in, in New Zealand, it turns out. Um, and they would chip away and force their grids onto um, un, often unwilling uh, topographical landscapes. Um, and you can see Christchurch on the left there, still very similar um, street pattern today. And on the right, I just as a as a town just north of where I am, and um, a place called Martinborough, and um, and I show this just to show very clearly how the um, colonisation was stamped onto our landscape. So you can see the the centre is a, a Union Jack of the of the town um, where they run a fair every every March. Um, other concerns have been around um, complete disregard of sites of significance for iwi. Um, if anyone's ever been to Auckland, you'll know it's a it's a city of many volcanoes and hills and um, fantastic landscape. Um, many of these hills have been quarried away uh, to make way for parks and flat building sites for housing. Um, this is in Devonport in the North Shore, once was a hill, now completely quarried away. Um, thankfully, there is now, um, perhaps a, sort of four or five years ago, um, the, the Maunga or the mountains of Auckland have been put into the hands of a, of a group which consists of, I think, half iwi or mana whenua uh, representatives and half uh, council representatives, and they now manage, manage those sites to ensure that they're cherished a bit more carefully. Um, but I think we continue to disregard Māori heritage. This is an article I wrote recently. Um, there's, a, there's a desire to densify our cities for good reason. There's a, there's a housing crisis happening in New Zealand. I'm not quite sure if it's the same in Australia, but there's a huge shortage of housing. Um, it's, it's kind of scary, actually, how, how very um, desperate many families are around the country um, and so there's a sort of drive on to densify our cities um, and also there's other kind of reasons why one might do that uh, but the council went to great lengths when they were developing the spatial plan to catalogue um, the famous colonial villas that sit in some of our historic more historic um, suburbs in Wellington here Thorndon and Mount Vic um, and, and they're so, you know, they're beautiful, but they're also, um, some of them are just horrendously cold, leaky, mouldy student um, dives. Uh, but they were catalogued one by one. They sent people around to make, see what their sort of heritage value was. And that formed a kind of key part of the spatial plan. Um, when it came to Māori heritage or sites of significance, uh, they just sort of, um, hopped an earlier plan that they'd, they'd produced, which was a series of dots on a, on a map that highlighted um, potential sites of significance for, for mana whenua, for the local tribe, um, and put that into the plan. Very little effort was put into understanding more clearly what that heritage was. And I think there's a, um, it's, it's very easy for people to um, disregard Indigenous heritage because it's often been erased for one, uh, but it, it also doesn't necessarily privilege the built form. Um, the environmental infrastructure, the whenua, the papatuanuku, our earth mother, is, uh, they're, they're more likely to be the, the aspects of our heritage that we want to make sure we preserve and get right. Um, so what do we need to do about it? I think there's a, there really is a need for, for an ongoing decolonial project, um, a reclamation and reinsertion of mātauranga Māori, i.e. Māori knowledge. Um, and I think why this is important is again for the reasons that Danielle was pointing out, pointing out earlier. Um, there is a, um, the way that Māori see knowledge and the world really, is think humans and non-humans are all related. Um, it's about whakapapa, so whakapapa means genealogy. Um, so we're tr constantly trying to look at what are the connections, what are the relationships, and how do we make it all um, all well and, um, and sustained. 
um, as compared to a sort of more um, Western understanding, which is very much about um, looking at something in isolation. Broadly speaking, I'm, I'm making gross assumptions here. Um, but this is the travesty of the colonization pro project as it's, as it's severed our knowledge. So many of us are starting to try to reclaim some of that knowledge. And so often our non Māori colleagues are like, oh, well, just tell us what to do. Just, you, all you need to do is tell us what to do and we'll do it. And they look at us sort of um, wondering why we don't just, you know, tell them, tell them the knowledge, all the knowledge that we have. Um, and it's very hard to explain what that actually many of us are trying to kind of reclaim that knowledge, um, you know, as we go. Um, sorry, I see we're running out of time. Okay, I'll just finish off with a couple more. Um, so this is just an example of um, a way in which we might organise Māori settlements by uh, Māori knowledge. So Kevin Lynch, which many of you may have heard of, talks about landmarks. The European kind of mode of doing that is to use is buildings, churches. Um, we've got our own DNA here, whakapapa, way of linking to the land, i.e. our mountains. Why are we not using those to organise our cities? Um, so I won't show the building and I'll just quickly run through this. Just to say, um, here's a few books if people are interested in. Um, Danielle has written in both of the ones on the right, um, but we've also produced a little book, Imagining Decolonization, which is less about the built environment, more general, but it may offer some useful insight into some broader issues around what is decolonization. Kilda. Thank you, Becky. That was wonderful. Um, so I'll hand over to Nana to Clarence. Clarence. I think is going to open a bit of a discussion around um, some of the more recent frameworks and um, work to design with country in New South Wales. Oh, yes, good morning, everybody. Jingwa, Walwalo Bayam, Guburan, or Nanang, and Walamber, and Yathbundumbara. I'm a Gujumbara fellow from uh, the far north coast of New South Wales. Good morning and uh, again, safe travels to all of my brothers and sisters, Bulang and Nana. Um, my dreaming is Bulamban, uh, the sacred mountain. And just as uh, Danielle spoke of earlier uh, about the sacred mountain on the south coast, Bulaga by Manga, we have a sacred mountain in Bunjalung country. So you know where uh, most of us sit, thanks uh, to Danielle and her talk. I would like to thank all of the uh, um, amazing women who have allowed me to speak with them in this platform. Um, I might go a little bit off topic and I, I feel a, a little bit, um, well, how shall we say, certainly not as powerful as, as what I've, I've heard already this morning. So hopefully I can keep up. And again, I, I really want to thank um, everybody involved with, with this project for uh, allowing my uh, XY chromosomes to partake in this uh, talk this morning. Now, uh, the frameworks, I suppose, when we, we talk about designing with country, the, uh, I, I find it um, interesting given, given my uh, number of career paths that I've chosen. I was lucky enough to, um, once upon a time, be a performing artist and, and travel to lots of different uh, countries within Australia and the Torres Strait and the islands of um, the, the, the Cape and, and the Tiwi Islands and lots of uh, Tasmania, the, the biggest island down, down south. But all of the, uh, you know, the spaces that we, we have in, in Australia. And if we go to the next slide, you actually, you know, most people are familiar with this um, in, in Australia. This is uh, you know, generally accepted as the map of Aboriginal Australia. And when we talk about country, we talk geographically, but uh, as you've already heard from both Becky and Danielle, country is a much broader concept and there are just so many elements to it that, you know, as Aboriginal people um, and as First Nations people generally, for many of us, there's been a disconnect uh, to country. Um, I've been lucky enough to, to be involved in lots of ceremonies and, and I still get onto country, um, even if it's not my own country, get, it, get out into the bush and, and enjoy the, the country and, and try to uh, you know, at, at least um, let the ancestors know that I'm there and, and, and try to connect to all of those 
elements that are within the the the, uh, the space of, of that that bushland. And when we we talk about um, country, the thing that I really enjoy is is language and the the imposition of you know what is the the colonial project, as, as Becky so um, eloquently put it. But that anglocentric paradigm that that is you know we have to control something and particularly in the built environment we know um this this uh grid pattern is not going to fit there's a there's a creek in the way so i know well, let's divert the creek and then we can you know fit all of these these uh blocks that we need to make this thing work um that just seems to me a very uh costly and time consuming um, proposition, given that you know Mother Nature will eventually let us know, and you know she has certainly been letting us know over the last couple of weeks here in Australia and on the east coast with the amount of water that's been um, delivered, um, you know, droughts and flooding rains. It's the, the the place that we have here, but you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and again First Nations people everywhere know that it's it's not something we can can control we are part of it we we have to understand how that works and and how all of the the little um you know the, not only the nuances but the the, the little creatures that re rely on us and and what we do to their ecosystems and you know that's one of the things that, that i'm really um, passionate about when it comes to design and working with design teams on you know, how, how do we look at particularly biodiversity? How do we look at that, particularly in our cities? As our cities grow, yes, we have a, a housing problem. We have a homelessness problem here in Australia. We have, but the, the housing problem is, is quite, um, to me, it's, it's quite a, a hypocritical kind of, of, of thing when we look at the size of houses that we are building. Um, you know, and there may not be very many people in there. You know, if we if we look globally, Australia's got some of the biggest houses. Um, you know, the square meterage per person is ridiculous, um, and yet you know we can't have you know we can't house everybody. It just doesn't make any sense to me. But on a on a broader scale, when we look at um, you know the black and grey spaces that we're creating, I'm really um, you know, really interested in, in how do we integrate more blue and green space and you know everyone's certainly familiar with with what's happening with uh, you know the, the um, heat island effect of cities and you know particularly roads and, and footpaths and buildings what that's doing to global warming and what we can do as um, you know certainly as designers but certainly as first nations people how can we get um, you know the 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 broader um, industry, I suppose, in, in, involved in, in that process and, and understand what it means to be connected to country and how to design with country. Um, you know, quite often you will see um, you know, buildings or, or spaces inspired by an artwork. Um, is that artwork actually from the area where you are building whatever it is you're building? Um, you know, be it a green space or be it a, a, a um, a dwelling or a residential or a commercial space. Uh, you, you know, it has to be in context and it has to be meaningful. And they, you know, these these policies and procedures that are that are coming in line for you know not just in in the design space but in many other uh, areas. You know, it, it shouldn't be a tick a box kind of. Um, you know, proposition. We need to really think about it. And when we talk about meaningful engagement, you know, having people who are going to be using those spaces or using those buildings or, you know, having to live within those spaces or nearby or, or you know, and certainly interacting with them, how can they, they, you know, yes, serve the people, but more importantly, serve country or serve, you know, the, the natural systems that rely on them. And they're some of the things that, that I've been looking at with, with my team and, and with other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, if we go to the next slide, there's a, a couple of things that we've been looking at and ecological systems are one. I'm a, a, a big fan of native plant species. Um, it's, uh, it's partly my, my uh, I guess, it's certainly my bread and butter, but yeah, I've grown up on farms, I've grown up in the bush, on the beach, I'm a saltwater man. I love the coast, but you know, 
I also love the, the desert country and, and just the contrast of what we have in this country. But you know, if, you, if we look at um, green space in particular, um, you know, how do we how do we have more biodiversity? How do we have those plant palettes that are going to serve as you know beautifully aesthetic and and you know pleasing spaces for humans? But how are they also going to serve the non-humans? And it's a, you know, a, a really nice thing to see. If we go to the next slide, hopefully there's a there's a few of our little friends popping up popping up. These are some of the, you know, this is a, a, a um, hand render by one of my team on a, a space that we developed. And yes, it looks like a, a, a beautiful art piece. And if we look at Aboriginal art generally, it's a, a top, you know, almost a satellite image of country. Um, and if you, you know what you're looking at symbolically, you can understand and find your way around country. And those connections to country are um, way deeper than we can cover in this, this short term. Um, if we go to the next slide, that, that uh, um, hand-drawn um, render becomes um, you know, embedded into the, the landscape architecture drawings and you can then implant the, the species. This particular um, installation, we started with about uh, 70 species, we're up to about 120. And we're, we're just trialling as many native species as we can and just really looking at, at ecological systems and how they can work in an urban environment. This, this garden is, is literally um, you know, uh, a stone's throw from the CBD of Sydney. Um, it's in, in Redfern and it's, um, you know, it's drawing so many insects and birds and um, you know, hopefully a, a few small mammals in there as well. We're not quite sure yet, but we'll, we'll get there. If we go to the next slide, there's a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of rooftop spaces. This one in particular, we planted two years ago. Um, but it's, you know, it's gone from uh, uh, you know, having just a, a, a black um, or gray roof and it's, uh, it's got about 60 species and probably two and a half thousand plants. So these are some of the things that um, yeah, I'm certainly interested in, as are many other people in the built environment. How do we get more green space? Um, rooftops are a, a classic example. Um, Melbourne City, for example, have commissioned a report to um, look at retrofitting and they, they found that 50% of buildings in Melbourne CBD can be retrofitted with green roofs. And again, bringing down that heat island effect for, um, for the city of Melbourne. Hopefully we can um, look at doing a lot more of this in, uh, in and around Sydney and some of our other major cities. Uh, if we go to the next slide, then this is just the, uh, the, the, planting, <laughs> the planting out of that, of that rooftop. Um, it was a lot of fun, but it was, um, yeah, it, it takes a lot of effort as well. Uh, if we go to the next slide, these are some of the, the outcomes. So this is, uh, you know, it, you can see just how, how uh, green it, it becomes. This is about 12 months in, and you know, some of the, the insects that have, have now set up shop, um, we were lucky enough to partner with the Landscape Architecture Foundation and um, a PhD candidate from UNSW to do some uh, insect um, data collection and we'll be releasing that very soon, hopefully. And you know, just this um, one small um, 500 square meter space in Redfern and how much biodiversity we've been attracting through the number of plants and more importantly, the number of species and native species that, that we've got in this space. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, this is something that I'm also very keen of, <laughs> to look at. Um, when we talk about uh, the built environment in particular, that, that I touched on it earlier about how the, I guess, the colonial um, the uh, eye for um, you know, changing the landscape to suit your needs um, has meant that we move water out of the landscape. Um, you know, and that makes it... it um, tricky in some areas. The, the photo on the, on the left is, is uh, what um, happens after a rather large rain event here in, um, in Everly, where the water from Waterloo, Redfern and Erskineville all converges into a bioretention basin, which is a very large space and, and sits for quite some time before it goes into the, the stormwater and out to the ocean. So um, 
really keen to, to look at how we can do biofiltration in rain gardens and putting in uh, native species that are going to use uh, evapotranspiration to filter nutrients, but also also um, also you know, take that that water out of out of where it is, but it hold it for a little bit longer than it would normally be sitting in there. And um, uh, I was really pleased to see last night actually in Canberra the lakes are now um, they're, they're using floating uh, swamp land to be able to um, filter the waters of, of the lakes in Canberra using those, those floating uh, marshes, marshland, which is a really cool, cool idea. Um, the next slide is really just something to you know, let us think about <laughs> designing with country. It, it, you know, the, the planet really is a, a beautiful place where you know, that, that idea that Danielle mentioned about how do we live here forever, that I think is something that should be front and center of everyone's mind when they're thinking about designing. Um, the, the, the great um, Aboriginal artist that we have here in Australia, uh, Uncle Archie Roach, who if you are in Sydney, is playing tonight at the State Theatre, um, has many beautiful songs, but one of, one of his songs is uh, um, A Child Was Born Here. And the, the, the core of that song is when you walk in the bush here in Australia, be careful where you walk because for thousands of years, thousands of generations, women were birthing their children under the, under the trees, in the bush, and the broken waters were was sustaining life and, and bringing forward life. And, uh, you know, Becky talked about the, the placenta, but both of my kids' placentas are planted back on country and there are trees growing on those you know, I, I know where the placentas are because the trees that I planted there are, are um, endemic trees to that area. So that's how I connect with country. And when I think about designing with country, I, I don't think about the policies and, and all of the, the frameworks and all of the legislation. You know, we we uh, here in Australia get um, you know, get very tired of, of, of you know, the Land Rights Act and the, the Native Title Act in particular when it comes to, you know, um, us as, as First Nations people and our rights to country. You know, our, our right to country um, is, is summed up, I, I suppose, in the, in the Torres Strait. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a law, L-A-W, of tag moki moki, teter moki moki. You don't touch another man's property without their permission. And you don't walk on their property without another man's position, uh, permission or woman's permission for that matter. But we don't own the land, we are part of the land. And that connection is the connection that we try to bring as First Nations people to the conversation. We, we, we want to be involved and you know, the communities where you work also want to be involved in those design processes and they really have something to say and really uh, bring something that, that is, is not, not quite unique, but it, it's certainly meaningful and it's certainly something that I think everyone should be involved in and should really reach out to, uh, you know, in the first instance, look at um, you know, how do we design with country and how do we design for the connection to that country, not just for First Nations people, but all of us who now have to, to live together and you know, move forward and try to live here forever. Thank you. Thanks, Clarence, and thanks, um, Danielle and Becky, again, also. Uh, that was amazing. It's probably also given us all a good insight, which, which we've been learning every time we have a conversation um, with our panellists, that there is so much to discuss on this topic, and that's part of the reason that we um, decided that it couldn't just be one event, that we needed to hold a whole series to even start to scratch the surface of this. Um, I think our panellists panelists have agreed that they can stay on for an extra few minutes to take some questions. So hopefully um, our attendees can stay to join that as well. But again, we will be providing this recording so that if you do have to miss the question time, um, you can still see that. So I suppose what comes from this and um, what's very clear to us is that uh, trying to make a connection to country is something that requires a very different way of thinking, particularly um, for our industry, but also for every individual who comes to approach this process. 
Um, and recently, the Government Architects Office has produced their paper um, around connection with country. And we know that the new design and place step will be um, looking to put country at the, the very beginning of all design processes that are run through the New South Wales Government, which is a real change to the process that we're using. But maybe um, I could start with you, Danielle. I wondered if you could speak a little bit to both the benefits of bringing this process or bringing some of this into a framework um, when it is such a broad and deep topic um, and also perhaps some of the pitfalls that might occur if we, if we codify this too much. Yeah. Um... I, if anyone who's read that knows that I was um, heavily cited in it, so which is lovely to be recognised like that. Um, so I, I, I largely think what they've written is really helpful um, to people in the built environment, but I don't want it to be misunderstood as being the answer um, and what the, everything's done. Actually, if you read the document, what it's saying is you need to create a connection with country. You personally need to create a connection with country. And it can't just happen within the context of your organisation or government. It's up to each of you to personally go out and develop that connection. And they give some ideas about how you might do that. But it's got to come from you because uh, country, and as we've all just spoken to is a relationship what we have with country is a relationship um, and it and it needs um, continual um, reconnecting and continual maintenance like any relationship you can't just go okay done I've done that check done that's not how it works for, with country it's actually um, something that we all have to maintain I was just down on my own country last week and walked up my sacred mountain my legs still ache from it um, one of my sacred mountains, Gulaga. Um, my leg's still really telling me that I did that, but it's a, it, it was um, a beautiful way for me to um, connect spiritually back to that place and physically as well, uh, and in so many other ways that I can't even describe. But that's, but that's just a, one example of how I connect to country, but I also do that in the urban environment. And so I guess the, those frameworks are useful to give ideas, but it's not the answer, the only answer. It's the first start that all of us need to make. The first point, point of call, it's not the final point of call. Um, and that's the challenge with um, government documents or anybody's documents really, um, that you think that's this is the answer. Awesome, now we've done it, we've done the work. Um, no, we haven't started yet. Thanks, Danielle. Um, Becky, maybe you could speak to any frameworks that you've seen in place in New Zealand that might be starting to show results of the process there? Mm, sure. Learned. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, in the, in the New Zealand context, um, there's a set of principles called the Te Aranga Principles, which actually came out of a... Um, the Ministry for the Environment set up a framework, an urban design framework, I think it was called, a few years ago, maybe not quite a few, maybe 10, 15 years ago now. And it included nothing of culture in, in it at all, no nothing, no cultural, no, nothing Māori, um, nothing. And um, so Māori designers around the country uh, got together and said, hey, hey, you know, come on, government, you haven't even... Um, you know, made any attempt to recognise um, the treaty relationship, the, you know, the Māori relationship here. And so they got together and um, developed these Te Aranga principles, so named after the, the meeting place where the, the principles were developed, co-developed by these Māori designers. And um, actually, out of that grew a network called Ngaho Māori Designers Network, which is uh, which is one of the reasons I know uh, Danielle. This sort of um, roundabout ways have have kind of met her through that network. And um, the the Te Aranga principles are used by Auckland City Council particularly. They um, it's part of their Auckland Design Manual. So if anyone's interested, you can go and have a look there. Um, 
And they've been really great at signaling the importance of things Māori. They're very high level principles, but they're, um, yeah, they've been great for doing that. However, they're not so great at the detail, or not, it's not the principles that are not great, it's the, the way that people respond to them. So they haven't been very good at the detailed level. Um, there are some instruments to try to encourage uh, developers and others to, to draw on them, like the urban design panel. Um, and that's worked uh, somewhat well in, in trying to get people to use them. Um, but they're still um, voluntary. And even if they weren't voluntary, um, as Danielle said, that's, that's sort of not really the point. The point is that you um, have to build those personal relationships with the mana whenua or the, or the tribe of that particular place uh, so that you can, you can design sophisticatedly, basically. Um, you can design with the people that you're, um, that on whose country you're standing um, so that you can create a sophisticated outcome. That's, that's, that's what it comes down to. It's whether you want a simplistic outcome or a sophisticated outcome. And um, sophisticated is when, you know, when it's really kind of rooted in, in the values and identities of the people for whom this land is, has always been there, you know, they've always belonged to, so, yeah. Thank you, that was great. Um, so Clarence, being kind of at the, the delivery end of some of that, some of these processes with your work, how are you finding the process of engagement changing at the moment? Um, and what hurdles have you come across uh, in delivering these projects that you showed us earlier? <laughs> I think the, the, the an, old, an old auntie who, uh, has since left us. She she summed it up perfectly. Probably twenty years ago, is that we um, as Aboriginal people in particular are probably the most consulted people on the planet. Um, you know, and whether that's through policy development or through you know um, co-management agreements, through MOUs, all of those things that just go you know, on and on. And and a lot of the stuff, particularly here in New South Wales, the stuff that's happening now, there are so many big projects happening, but even the smaller projects, everybody wants uh, input from the local community. And then, and that's quite difficult. Um, and some of the, the, the I've been doing is, is trying to um, alleviate to some extent the, um, well, Burden is probably not the right word, but certainly the, the burden of time, um, you know, of, of you know, the bringing the community in. If, if there's a community, um, you know, in using Sydney as an example or a particular part of Sydney, there may well be 10 or 20 projects and everybody wants to consult with community. So that's a, that's a big drain on, on the community. And, and often it's a, there's an expectation that they, they just give up their time because, oh, look, it's going to be a benefit to the community. So that's to me that's the that's the thing that is 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 quite difficult to you know it, i know that there's there's a lot of designers there's a lot of people in the industry who want to have local involvement but it's not that simple you, you know and it, there shouldn't be an expectation that oh you just give up your time and come and help us with this project um you know the, um, danielle and becky may have a bit more insight into this as well but with the you know We've done a few co-designs, uh, particularly in, in landscape projects, and but uh, with the expertise of myself and my, and my team, we've been able to you know, show in situ different um, spaces and different plants and what endemic species are, what you know, local native species, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's more about the you know, the personal interaction of what that space can offer to the people once it's once it's finished so they're the sort of things that i'm really interested in is is you know there's no point doing something because it looks good if no one's going to use it that's you know, it just doesn't make any sense to me at all so you know but the initial um involvement and engagement is is also difficult if as i said you've got you know multiple projects where you've got lots of different design teams wanting involvement from the same people yeah that's a that in itself makes things very difficult. But I think it comes back to what Danielle said, is that yeah, it, individuals should connect 
to, to country. You know, we're, we're all we're all connected to this country now. You know, um, <laughs> we can't get away from that. So if people get get more of an understanding and certainly more of a feeling for the places that where they live, the places they're going to be designing in, that's a good start then to you know open up the conversation. Absolutely, Clarence. We have a question here from the audience. I'll just read it out um, and perhaps Danielle, you could start to speak to this. It says, in New South Wales, connection with country is a priority for designing the built environment, as well as us each developing our own relationships with country. The statutory requirements will generate the need for a lot of specialist Indigenous consulting services, which you were speaking to then, Clarence. Um, every Indigenous consultant has their own unique approach and methodology to providing this service. How will the quality of service be ensured when the demand for these services is likely to become very large within a very condensed period of time? And are the specialist consultants sharing any common frameworks amongst themselves in respect to their methodologies? So, Danielle, perhaps you could speak to that. Yeah. Um... Yeah, look, it's it's um it's a bit overwhelming. I because I'm a um, a consultant, if you want, I find find that word strange, but uh, that's the space that I work in in my own practice. I also have a job, um, and a year ago I couldn't get a job despite having a PhD. It was really tough, and now I'm overwhelmed and can't keep up. Um, suddenly. And it's, it's like suddenly the light's been switched on to Aboriginal culture and heritage and everyone's looking for um, an answer. The, the thing is, um, you know, we've not been considered in, or given time until now and we're still not being given time in a whole other way to, ca to get our systems and processes in place. We've had, we have ancient processes that we want to bring in, but the system that we're working within of the built environment does not match. And the way that we need to work with um, our communities and with country requires a whole other level of, um, a whole other methodology, a whole other uh, way of working and a whole other time frame. So in my job, um, which I'm a cultural scientist, isn't that a cool name? I think anyway, um, I'm working with communities to, um, to consider planning with country so that's at a whole other scale that's you know a whole country scale uh, and that's going to take probably the rest of my life so bearing in mind these are the time frames that i'm looking at is a, a really long time for that to, to turn around where um whatever mob i'm working with can develop their own plans so that when the water company whenever the um, architect whenever um, an engineering firm needs to know something, they can go to these, these plans for country and that are obviously going to be continually um, iterative documents, but that, that, that they can refer to them. And um, a lot of that work's already been done. You have to remember the built environments had 230 odd years to mess things up and we are now trying to jump in afterwards and put in our own structures within that structure. But ideally, it would be great if we could do it a whole new way of working. And that involves sometimes you guys need to push back against the time frames and push back against how quickly things are happening um, and understand that we're still trying to um, work out how to do all of this in within that, that, that structure. Um, so that, yes, we are working, just to answer the question, yes, um, we are trying to work on other ways of working, but you, we do need time to bring that into, into projects um, in a few different ways, not least that we need understanding that the way that we're working doesn't suit the way that we understand the world. Our worldview is different from the way that the built environment works. We're working in a country worldview <laughs> or, a, or a First Nations worldview and um, what's what we're working into is a Western worldview and they, the two very rarely meet and speak well together. Um, I would also say that most First Nations designers and architects work in a uh, with, within a country centred design type methodology. They have, will have different ways of describing it. Basically country and culture is at the centre of our processes. And while, of course, none of us are going to use each other's way methodologies, that's not how it works. We all have our own that we've that have come from our ancestry, that have come from our um, knowledge systems, that have come from our families. Um, our um, 
that generally they're based around country and culture and community being at the center really different from western worldviews which is why i guess i'm saying hey give us a hand here make sure we've got enough time to do our work maybe put us in there like a year before you start the project so that we can actually work with the community um to go what is it that we really need to be doing here like a year before all the rest of the people start working on the project Anyway, I know that's a, a big ask, but I'm, I guess I'm asking you to help us. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm aware of time and I know we have a lot of other questions. As I said, we are having um, other events that we um, will bring forward um, some of the questions that have come from this. Uh, particularly, I, I suppose, just to note off the back of your comments there, Danielle, I heard a, a wonderful Indigenous lady speak at a property council and she said, please, um, there's just not enough of us to meet all of your quotas. If everyone says they want 10% Aboriginal people employment, we, we, there's not enough of us to go around. And I guess that's something we'll all have to um, work together with uh, and see how we and other professionals can um, take some of that load uh, in an appropriate way and what those appropriate ways are. And I, I suppose after all, it, it is our responsibility for um, doing the original messing up of country um, and taking that land away. So we should also take responsibility and put in a lot of the effort to, um, to fix it as well. So um, I, I personally, and I know others on the panel and in our group really, um, are very open and look forward to how we all learn that process and we hope we can share some of that in our upcoming events as well. So I would just like to um, really thank everybody for, for joining this um, initial discussion and absolutely thank you so much for all of your all to all of the speakers today for sharing your insights and your knowledge. Um, I know it is both very personal thing and you're obviously all so passionate and we're lucky to have you in our industry to help guide us along the way. And if everybody who's attended today would like to keep in mind that we will have the other, um, other two events coming up and we also have a ULI summit in early June, which we would also like to cover this topic maybe as a wrap up of our event series. Um, so that will be coming up in your diaries as well. So thank you again to everybody for joining and hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks very much guys. <laughs>